right, everybody, we're going to talk here about intussusception, super duper high yield for your exam. Uh, I guarantee you, whether it be step one, two, or three, you will get asked some sort of question on intussusception, including potentially the management, especially step two and three. This is also very, very common to come up on CCS. So what that means is that you need to know the management of intussusception from clinical suspicion and presentation all the way out to discharge. Um, there aren't many disorders that commonly come up on CCS. On CCS, they tend to be very straightforward cases. In fact, you may be able to figure out the diagnosis just based on the patient's um, immediate presentation when you're given the vignette. CCS is not so much about figuring out the diagnosis. It's more um, asking you to show that you know how to go through a workup. So um, that's something important to keep in mind. Again, very, very, very high yield topic here. So I want you to know this from beginning to end. And I put uh, I, at the very end of this, I put together sort of a, uh, uh, a flow of how you would go through uh, diagnosing and managing uh, these patients, which I think will help you on CCS as well as for clinical practice. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so intussusception is the surgical emergency. Basically, what is going on here is that you have an invagination of a proximal part of the small bowel that telescopes in to the distal segments of the small bowel. And this is usually small bowel. Most commonly, it's actually the ileum, which uh, goes into the... Uh, the large bowel. So it's kind of a small bowel, large bowel thing, but this almost always involves the small bowel in some way. Okay, so 75% um, so of cases occur in small children under the age of one, and it is the most common cause of intestinal obstruction of children under the age of two. It tends to happen in males more than females. This can happen, however, in any age. Now, in children, this tends to be due to an enlarged lymph node. And so commonly what happens is they have a viral infection, uh, usually some sort of viral diarrhea like rotavirus. Uh, that starts, they've got diarrhea, and then this abdominal pain does not really go away. And so that can present a little bit of a diagnostic challenge because they have this diarrhea and abdominal pain, and then the abdominal pain continues, and so it can be difficult to tease this out. With adults um, and older children, it's usually a neoplasm or a mechal diverticulum, but there can be other uh, causes as well. So in a vignette, look for a small child with a history of diarrhea, watery diarrhea, and now they've got this colicky abdominal pain um, that really won't go away. Symptoms are going to be consistent with a small bowel obstruction, so colicky abdominal pain, um, not passing gas, not passing stool. Uh, this red currant jelly stool, uh, this, is, this is a buzzword. It may not get thrown at you. Um, what they may tell you is just simply a positive GUAC test um, or something like that. Uh, an abdominal mass is common as well. Um, usually this is in the right upper quadrant or in the epigastrium. They may tell you there's a scaphoid appearance of the right lower quadrant. Um, that's that's not unusual as well. So we were, what we're looking at here is a triad of uh, bowel obstruction, red currant jelly stool, and abdominal mass. That's really typical for intussusception, but only about, I think it's about a fifth or a quarter of patients actually have that triad. So again, look for a, a young child with a history of, a, uh, of some sort of GI viral infection, so like a, a gastroenteritis, and now they've got colicky abdominal pain and positive uh, stool guayac. 
You've got to pay attention to signs of peritonitis in any patient that has a small bowel obstruction, but especially into susception because it will dramatically change our management. If the patient is stable and has no signs of peritonitis, then the best initial diagnostic test is an abdominal ultrasound. I will just point out that any time when you're dealing with a child, um, if it's similar symptoms to what you may expect in an adult, you always want to err on the side of not doing any kind of uh, x-ray or CT because we don't want to expose the child to radiation. So ultrasound is typically the best test that we can do, especially in a child, uh, because it avoids that radiation. So the diagnosis is an abdominal ultrasound. It's highly sensitive, highly specific. So this is the best test to go with. Um, and what you'll find is this target sign. And so what you see here is intussuscepted bowel um, that is enclosed within uh, the distal bowel. So this is what it, what it looks like, the target sign. So make sure that you know what the target sign looks like and you know what the target sign means because on CCS, for instance, you may order an abdominal ultrasound and they'll tell you that it's a target sign or on a multiple choice question, they may actually show you the ultrasound. If you were to get a CT, you can see something very similar. Here's your target sign here, and you can actually see the intussuscepted bowel um, telescoping into distal bowel. The management is uh, a reduction with contrast. This can be either a barium contrast or it can be air contrast. It doesn't really matter. Air contrast is said to possibly be a little bit better, uh, but on the USMLE, you'll probably uh, be asked for a barium contrast. They're fine. Either or are okay. Supportive orders should be given immediately um, upon suspicion, so it never hurts to give antiemetics. We don't want these patients more uncomfortable than they already are, and certainly puking is going to make them more uncomfortable. Analgesics, go ahead, give morphine. Uh, IV fluids, that's all very important, uh, even before you make your formal diagnosis. You've got a patient that's been throwing up, always give antiemetics. You've got a patient that's in severe abdominal pain, go for analgesics. It never hurts. Because these patients are impossible need of surgery, depending on what happens, make sure that you have your pre-surgical orders in. These patients should be NPO until symptoms resolve. NG suction is good. Um, and then, of course, PTT. Uh, PT and type and cross match are going to be important as well because these patients may need laparotomy. Antibiotics are controversial in stable patients. Um, if they don't have signs of peritonitis, they're optional. If they do have signs of peritonitis, however, you need to get blood cultures and administer antibiotics, which cover enteric pathogens. So you're looking like uh, looking at maybe clindamycin and gentamicin or a carbapenem or something like that. Um, again, if they do have signs of peritonitis, we're not going to bother with, with any kind of, of contrast reduction. Our next step, if they do have signs consistent with peritonitis, would be to get a, a laparotomy for an open reduction. And so this would be sort of the, the flow of how I would go about this. If you've got a patient, a young child coming in with colicky abdominal pain and vomiting, make sure you get a focused exam, and that needs to include a rectal exam. What you'll see with intussusception is squayac positive stools. They may tell you that they have a sausage-shaped mass in the right upper quadrant. At that point, um, you want to make sure you're doing all your supportive stuff. If you went with IV fluids, morphine, and Zofran for a patient coming in with colicky abdominal pain and vomiting, you did that first, that would be okay. Um, remember, you'll see uh, a target sign when you do your abdominal ultrasound. That's really important to get when you've got a patient with colicky abdominal pain in a right upper quadrant mass. You then go with your initial lab, CBC, BMP, never hurt. You may get blood cultures, you may get an abdominal x-ray, um, but if you have your typical finding on abdominal ultrasound, you really can get rid of that. Your pre-surgical labs are going to be important at this point, NPO, NG2, PT, PTT. You should place a Foley as well because these are surgical patients who need IV fluids. We want to monitor their urinary output. You'll consult surgery, and then the treatment, provided they're stable, is going to be an air contrast or barium enema. You may or may not give antibiotics. If there are signs of peritonitis, you absolutely give antibiotics uh, after getting a blood culture and then laparoscopy. Uh, actually, that should be 
Uh, it can be either laparoscopy, laparoscopy or laparotomy. Um, either are fine on your exam, but laparotomy um, is sort of the gold standard. And then um, after you have your reduction, admit them for overnight observation and advanced diet uh, as their pain goes away.